Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about the principles of cooking. So what is cooking? Cooking is simply the transfer of energy from a heat source to a food. To cook food successfully, you must understand the ways in which heat is transferred. There are three ways, conduction, convection, and radiation. So there's different ways in which those three elements are applied. So that can be through broiling, grilling, roasting, baking, sauteing, pan frying, deep frying, poaching, simmering, boiling, steaming, braising, and stewing. Um, we'll go into more depth on each one of those uh, in a future slide. But let's talk about heat transfer. So according to the principles of cooking, heat is a type of energy. When a substance gets hot, the molecules have absorbed energy, which causes the molecules to vibrate rapidly. The molecules start to expand and bounce off one another. As the molecules move, they collide with nearby molecules, causing a transfer of heat energy. Heat transfer can be transferred to foods through conduction, convection, or radiation, but heat travels through food by conduction. Conduction. Conduction one of the most basic principles of cooking is the movement of heat from one item to another through direct contact. For example, when a flame touches the bottom of a pan, heat is conducted to that pan. Generally, metals are good conductors, copper and aluminum are the best conductors, while liquids and gases are poor conductors. Conduction is a slow method of, hand, of heat transfer because there must be a physical contact from one molecule to another. So. Think of um, if anyone's ever made a pot of rice, um, you have to be very careful because the bottom of the pan that is in direct contact with heat has a tendency to burn or overcook or become mushy because it is not as uh, efficient because you're only having one heat source from the one contact of the pan. Um, and talking about conductors, that's in a, in a metal pan, which is a good conductor, so therefore the heat can transfer very freely. Um, but if you wanted to cook something that needs to be gentler, like maybe you're melting chocolate, that's when a double boiler comes into hand when you put, place a bowl over steam. So that steam is conducting heat to the chocolate, but at a much more gentler rate. Now convection, convection is the transfer of heat through a fluid. The fluid may be in a liquid or gas state. According to the principles of cooking, there are two types of convection, natural and mechanical. Natural convection causes a natural circulation of heat because warm liquids and gases have a tendency to rise while cooler ones fall. So as a, a simmering pot of stock is simmering, the, the liquid on the bottom, which is uh, in direct contact with the heat, is causing the water to evaporate in the pan and it causes the bubbles to rise. So now you have the, the, the vapor is rising and bursting at the top and it causes and creates a circulation because we have, a, we have the, the natural rhythm of the uh, bubbles rising. And mechanical convection causes heat to circulate more evenly and quickly through fans or by stirring. So if I was making a, um, a sauce, um, I need to make sure that I'm stirring it consistently so that it heats more evenly. And that means the heat is being um, distributed throughout the, the molecules of the sauce in a more even pattern. And if I were to stop stirring, that means now the convection is over and that means that bottom has more chance to scorch. Um, true or pure convection ovens used um, in higher-end ovens and higher-end restaurants have an additional element that surrounds the fan that circulates heated air inside the oven. So the fan forces heated air horizontally through the oven racks around the food, cooking it more evenly. Another example of this would be an air fryer. So everybody's obsessed with their air fryer, so that's what it's doing. It has a fan involved with a heated element that circulates the air all the way around the food to make it brown and heat efficiently. Virtually any food that you cook in a regular oven benefits from convection cooking. Actually, your wallet might benefit from it too because a convection oven 
uh, heats the oven faster and cooks the food 25% faster and usually at a 25 degrees lower than ordinary ovens. So if I was baking cookies that called for the oven to be set at 375 in a convection oven, I would only need to set it to 350. Uh, poultry skins are crispy because they render faster and while the meat stays juicy. Roasted vegetables caramelize more and baked goods uh, brown more evenly. Now radiation heat, um, the energy is transferred by waves of heat or light striking the food. That's a microwave. Uh, the two types of radiant heat are infrared and microwave. Um, infrared cooking is commonly used in toasters and broilers. These devices use an electric or ceramic element heated to such a high degree that it gives off waves of radiant heat. Microwave cooking relies on radiation generated by an oven to heat the food. So now let's talk about the effects of the heat. So when you apply heat, uh, it makes proteins coagulate. Uh, coagulation has been a protein um, transformed from liquid state to a solid state. So an example would be the firming of meat fibers and egg whites changing from clear liquid to a white solid when heated. So as you're cooking an egg, if you can picture a fried egg, when it first goes into the pan, it is in a liquid state, but as it cooks, it firms up and turns solid white. That is coagulation. Um, heat also causes starch to starches to gelatinize. When a mixture of starch and liquid is heated, starch granules swell. And the th liquid thickens because the starch granules will swell to occupy more space. An example would be thickening sauces when starch is added. So if I was making a gumbo or a bechamel, which is a white sauce, I would heat um, some flour with some type of fat and add a, once that's cooked out, I add a liquid to it, and as it is heated, the starches start to absorb all of that liquid, and you get a nice, thick gravy. Another thing that happens when heat is applied is that sugars caramelize. As sugars cook, they turn brown and change flavor. Caramelized sugar is used in many sugars, candies, and desserts. In fact, caramelization is one of the most the most flavors we associate with cooking. So think of um, vegetables have a natural sugar element to them. So when you roast them, that causes them to caramelize. Or think of onions. Onions cooked low and slow tend to turn brown, and that is their natural sugars begin to caramelize, and it kind of transforms their flavor. Uh, water evaporates. All foods contain some amount of uh, water, and the evaporation of water dries the food during cooking. And fats melt. So fats are greasy, smooth substance that don't dissolve in water. Oils are fats that remain liquid at room temperature, such as olive oils and um, canola oil. And fats melt when heated and then gradually liquefy. So think of butter, um, lard, um, Crisco, or shortening. At room temperature, they are solid, but they gradually start to liquefy when they are uh, heated. And fats will not evaporate. So um, if you are um, you accidentally evaporate a pan of sauce, um, there will still be a slick layer of fat. If um, there is any fat remaining, those will never uh, evaporate. And then how do we determine doneness when we're cooking food? Um, you can observe the physical changes in the food, such as touching the food. So as proteins um, coagulate, they also become firm. So a piece of chicken should be very bouncy when touched back and shouldn't have any give to it as it cooks. Um, or when you're making a steak, a lot, of, a lot of chefs like to use their hand as a gauge um, of how their steak is cooked instead of relying on a uh, thermometer. Um, you can also observe the surface color and texture. So if I am sauteing a piece of chicken, it's going to turn brown, but the flesh is also going to turn more of an opaque color. Um, if anybody's made shrimp, that starts off as a grayish, clearish, translucent color, and as it cooks, it becomes pink and opaque. So that is a, an, a clear sign of whether something is cooked. Or think of a lobster. A lobster doesn't start off as red, but as it cooks, the color will tell you that it's ready. Um, another way to tell if it's done is to, temp is to test the temperature um, after it's cooking using a thermometer, which is the most accurate way to do it 
So if you don't like to have any kind of guessing uh, using a thermometer, it would be your best bet. Um, but there's also something called carryover cooking. So if I was making my Thanksgiving turkey and the bigger the turkey is and the bigger the food is, when it's cooking in the oven, if I pulled it at its ideal temperature, say 165, uh, because it is so large, it has, um, it has absorbed some heat. So it's going to continue to cook when I remove it from the oven. So my beautifully cooked turkey, as it sits, is going to now become overcooked if I let it, if it, uh, as it sits on the counter. So the idea is when you have a large piece of meat like that, is that you want to pull it before it's at your, like a five to 10 degrees off of your um, final temperature. So then the carryover cooking will allow it to carry over to its correct temperature. Uh, that same if you're making a, uh, a standing rib roast or something like that, um, it just will, there's always a, little, a, a certain degree of carryover cooking. And the larger the item is, the more carryover cooking it is, there is. Um, so dry uh, heat methods use air or fat to kind of um, help transfer that heat. Um, and moist cooking methods uh, rely on water and steam. Um, combination cooking methods uh, employ both um, dry and heat methods. So a lot of times it's kind of confusing and a lot of people will say, well, isn't deep frying a wet cooking method because you're submerging it in what appears to be a liquid, but it's actually not because what's happening to the surface of that food is it's actually dehydrating. As those bub all those bubbles that come off and when you add something to the fryer is actually liquid evaporating, which causes your food to become crispy because it's drying. So it's not really a moist, it's not adding moisture to the food. So different very vari um, variations of dry heat methods. We have broiling, grilling, roasting and baking, which are the same thing. So that is a trick question if I ever ask you what the difference is. Um, barbecuing, sauteing, stir frying, pan frying, deep frying. These are all examples of a dry heat method. Moist heat methods such as poaching, uh, there's submerging poaching, which is like you're poaching an egg where the egg is completely submerged in the water. Or there's shallow poaching. Say I was doing a, a piece of fish, I wouldn't have to completely um, submerge that protein in a liquid. Um, also poaching, imagine that you're in a jacuzzi and you turned the, uh, the jets off. That's what you want your poaching liquid to be. You want to see some bubbles forming on the edges, but you don't want to see any active bubbles forming um, on the surface. Um, that then you, that's when you walk, move into simmering and boiling where you see active bubbles. That means the temperature is a little higher. Um, and then there's also steaming, which is another uh, moist heat method. There's also combination cooking. So combination cooking, such as braising or stewing, in the first step you brown the main ingredient used. So say I was making short ribs, I would brown those first. Um, and then the second step is to complete the cooking by simmering the food in a liquid. So a braise uses a small amount of liquid and a stew would use enough liquid to cover the food. So if I'm making braised short ribs, I wouldn't add enough liquid to cover the short ribs, just enough to get to add some steam. Um, but in a stew, I would cover the meat completely and simmer it uh, until it was cooked. Another popular combination method that's becoming um, more trendy is sous vide. So sous vide is a vacuum sealed pouch of seasoned food that is submerged in a temperature controlled water bath. So if I was cooking a piece of steak and I wanted to cook it to 130 degrees, I could easily just vacuum seal it and put it in the bath and it would be impossible for me to overcook it because it would never go over 130 degrees. So if I was cooking for a large amount of people, this is a nice way to ensure that everybody's meat is going to be cooked to the exactly the same temperature um, because the cooking is very precise and steady. Um, the meat also uh, retains its tenderness and never has a chance for those proteins to get uh, coagulate quickly and become tough um, and it'll have no caramelization at that point. So then when you take it out of the bag, you can actually brown it after it's cooking. So it's kind of the reverse of a braise. And that's it. So now that you guys have gotten a better understanding of the different cooking methods, I can't wait to see what you guys can do in the kitchen.